are meant to go past your emotions and your mental realm and enter your heart and your spirit realm. God's looking for a harvest. And I'm not talking about the kind of harvest that we've heard, sowing and reaping and wealth and, and health and those things. I'm talking about a kingdom harvest. And he's looking for that harvest to come forth out of your life. He's looking for you to reproduce. He's looking for you to become a harvest in, in the seasons in which we live. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 24. We're going to begin reading in verse 11, but I'm going to lay a little foundation. Today is Pentecost Sunday. Shout that with me, Pentecost Sunday. <laughs> Do you understand Matthew chapter 24 verse 11? Do you understand that without Passover, there cannot be a Pentecost? Pentecost came 50 days after, after Passover. And, and, and it was Passover that enabled there to be the, 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 the Pentecost, which is the feast of first fruit. There could not be a first, fe uh, a first fruits feast with their out their first being a Passover. Now, we understand that those are feasts and that they're Jewish traditions, but there was something much more spiritual that was happening outside of a feast or, 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 or a special holy day. Passover was the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It was it monumented the shedding of His blood, that that blood would bring remission and forgiveness of our sins. And most people stop at the power of the blood, but the new covenant does not stop at the power of the blood. The power of the blood is the beginning of the covenant because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Come on, somebody say, our sins must be forgiven. But here's where we have, we have short changed the gospel. We have said that the shedding of blood was so that you and I could go to heaven. Heaven is only the rewards. It, it is not the totality of why Christ shed his blood. I know that everybody has made heaven and hell the, the whole purpose of why Christ died. But it has more to do with just us going to heaven. The fact is, is there could have been no Pentecost. Now, to many people, Pentecost is about speaking in tongues and, and cloven tongues of fire and winds blowing. And, and yes, it was. It was powerful. It was profound. For some people, it's about speaking in tongues and gifts and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and all of that's good and it's important and it's part of it. But what you must understand is this, is that the day of Pentecost represented the birth of the church. Mm, it was the birth of God's church because the church is not a building. It's not a temple. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 24, in another place, this temple that you're looking at is going to be torn down. There will not be one, one uh, 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 block left on top of another. This thing is going to be destroyed because God said, I don't live in temples that are built by the hand of men. Do you understand? God said, I'm about to resurrect me a new temple. You understand that Jesus told them that he was that temple. He said, you're going to tear it down in three days. I'm going to build it back. They thought they were talking about the, the temple in Jerusalem. He wasn't talking about that temple. He was talking about he being the temple of God. But how many of you understand that those of us who have received what Christ did on the cross, that we have been a partaker of Passover and Pentecost, that we have become his first fruits? Woo, we have become the firstborn. Among many, the scripture says. What does that mean? That means that we became the temple of God on the day of Pentecost. That God said, I'm moving my throne from somewhere in the third dimension of the Milky Way. That I'm moving my throne into your hearts and lives. That you are going to be my tabernacle. That you are going to be my dwelling place. The entire new covenant is about God moving into you that he is now your God and you are his people. That it's no longer that I am living for the God of a book, but that I am living for the living God that lives and dwells on the inside of me. Woo, are y'all with me today? So you got to understand Pentecost had a whole lot to do uh, with, with the just speaking in tongues. It had to do with the transformation of an individual's life because what happened is that man became born again, that they went from experiencing God from an outer realm to experiencing God on the inside. Do you remember what Jesus said in John chapter 14? He's with you, but I will be in you. Woo, because he went from there to here and he sat on the throne of our hearts and he became the Lord of our lives 
Are you following me? That's why the scripture says as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Do you understand? It's not just enough. Oh, I, ooh, I got a feeling. Yeah, I got touched by the Holy Spirit. Listen, I don't need you to be touched by the Holy Spirit. I need you to be transformed by the Holy Spirit. I need for you to understand that when God moves in, it changes every aspect of who you are. That once you were lost, but now you're found. That you were uh, in the world, but now you're in the kingdom of God because you've been born again, according to John 3. That if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. It brings to pass Romans chapter uh, 12 verse 2. Be not conformed to this world but transformed by the renewing of your mind that you know the perfect and acceptable will of God. I don't have to try to, to, to interpret what the scriptures teach. I now have the Holy Spirit that reveals what the scriptures teach and shows me right and wrong. I don't need a preacher to tell me when I sin. I already know that I sin before the preacher ever said it. Come on, because he lives on the inside of me. Because the creator of heaven and earth lives in us. Come on, this is the new covenant. The one who parts the waters. The one, can I preach in here, who makes, who makes seas his highway. The one who raises the dead and opens the blind eyes. That is the one that lives on the inside of you. Woo, come on, and you think you got problems? Listen, you want to tell me that some little methamphetamine is going to hold you captive when the creator of heaven and earth lives on the inside of you? You're going to tell me you can't get past some offense or hurt when God lives on the inside of you? You're going to tell me you can't beat a habit when the one who parted the Red Sea and raised a dead man from the grave after four days dead? Come on, church. My God, salvation means something. Salvation is God's power to change. The law had no power as it related to changing the evil nature of mankind. But the Holy Ghost came and changed everything. Woo, he gave us the nature of God. Come on, and as we follow him, somebody say as we follow him. As we're led by the Holy Ghost. Come on, we're going from glory to glory. That don't mean I'm going from one big uh, check in the mail to the next big check in the mail. Has nothing to do with money or the car you drive. Has nothing to do with the standard of living that you're living by. It has to do that you go from looking more like Jesus to looking more like Jesus. Every step of obedience leads to the manifestation of Christ in you. If you keep following him, it's going to transform you. If you keep following him, he's going to renew your mind. He's going to change your thinking. He's going to change your desire. And every day, the things that once held you captive, you will be free from them. That's why the Bible said, he who's the son sets free is free indeed. Religion changes the outward man, but God changes the inward man. That's why Jesus told the Pharisees, you got the outside of the cup clean, but the inside is still filthy. That's why so many Christians, they come to church and they look all good on Sunday and on Monday they act like hell. Mm -hmm. Don't look at me that way. They just go out there and act just like the devil. Don't, don't, don't look at me like I cuss. They go out there and look just like the devil. I'm using hell right in this context. They go out there and they act wrong. They talk wrong. They, they treat people wrong. It ain't right, church. It ain't right. It ain't right. It ain't right. If I'm a Christian, it ought to show not in the sermon I preach, but the life I live. And you know what? You may not be there yet, but you at least ought to be. People ought to know that there is a change in process. There is a transformation that is in the making. That, yeah, hey, listen, I know that I still got some things God's working out, but you just keep watching, honey, because God's working. And the world's losing its hold on me. The flesh is dying daily because there's a cross I carry every day. And I carry that cross with grace. Now, what does Pentecost Sunday have to do with Matthew 24? Let me show you. Matthew 24, verse 11 says, many false prophets. Everybody say that, many false prophets. Will rise. And deceive many. What is the results of false prophets? The next verse tells us what? Sin or iniquity, which is sin, will abound. The results of false teachings. 
The Bible says in the book of Timothy that Paul writes and says that in the last days, men will have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Do you understand that a gospel without the Holy Spirit is not the gospel? I don't care how you color it, how you, how you doctrinize it, or theorize, or, uh, theorize it. If you have a gospel without the Holy Spirit, it is not the gospel. I don't care how much you preach Jesus, you can't preach Jesus without the Holy Spirit because the fact is, is that God is the Holy Spirit. Christ is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is Christ, and Holy Spirit is the Father. They operate in three different realms. If you don't believe it, you better, read, you better read your Bible. John chapter 14 says these words. He said to him, if you keep my word, my Father and I will come and make our abode in you. That word abode is the same uh, uh, word as mansions in verse 3. In my Father's house are many mansions. <laughs> yeah, what mansions? You a mansion? I'm a mansion. You don't get it. God was telling them, where I am, there you will be also. In other words, he said, listen, it's expedient that I go away. I'm sending another. I'm sending the comforter. And he said in that verse that that comforter was he and the Father, that we are one just as he and the Father one. Why? Because God moved in. Now he's my God and I'm his child. Are you following me? This is a covenant. I don't serve a God over there. I serve a God right here inside of me. He lives with me. I wake up with him every morning. Listen, he don't visit me. I'm his habitation. See, we got this problem. We're chasing revival. Guys, I'm a part of one of the biggest revivals of our lifetime. And I explained to you something. Everybody's chasing revival when you are the revival. We, we're chasing God in a building. And the fact is, is you are the building. You should be the walking manifestation of the power and the glory of God. You shouldn't have to go somewhere to get it. You ought to be able to get on your knees humbly and be the walking revival. You should be a walking and awakening. You should be full of the Holy Ghost that when you walk in a room, somebody ought to say, I smell Jesus. You understand, it's like, it's, like, it's, it's like when that woman walked in the room with her alabaster box and she broke that, that, that alabaster and, and broke that perfume and began to anoint the feet of Jesus. Don't you understand? It changed the aroma in that room. She was a sinner, but she changed the whole atmosphere. We ought to walk in a room with such a manifestation of Christ in us that we change the fragrance of the room. <laughs> My God. The Bible says that we are fragrance unto him. We ought to walk in a room. Listen, I ain't, you ought to walk in a room and be a, a, a healing bomb. You should walk in a room and be a, a ministry of deliverance. Why? Because the God who delivers lives on the inside of you. Why? Because the God that heals lives on the inside of you. The God that raises us out of the ashes lives on the inside of you. Watch this. The Bible says many false prophets will arise. False prophets that talk about Jesus, but they don't explain the new covenant. They have a form of godliness, but no power. There is no regeneration. I, 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 listen, I, I confess to you today that it is of my personal belief that I believe that 85% of the church has never been born again. I don't believe they've had an encounter that has transformed their life. I believe they have an intellectual knowledge of Jesus, but I do not believe they've had a conversion. I believe that they believe in Jesus sincerely, but they have never truly repented to have a born-again experience that their life has changed. And the other danger of that is the preachers that preach that you can't, that you can't walk away from a born-again experience because you can. And let me tell you something. When you let sin in your life unrepented, let me tell you what your relationship with God does. It begins to go downhill just like this. The nature of God that once manifested from your life begins to distinguish and it begins to, to, to disperse out of your life because you made room for sin and no room for God. And your nature begins to change. Your perspective perspective begins to change. Your, your, your worship begins to change. Everything in your life begins to revert back to the old man because you let sin stay in your life and you refuse to repent. And that preaching exists in our churches today. Go ahead and live any way you want to live. You don't have to repent after you've been saved. 
You're under grace. Live like you want to live. Everything's fine. No, it's not fine. Keep living. That's why some people can't come out of the hell of addiction. That's why they can't come out of the bondages that they're living in. That's why they can't advance in their walk with God and become who God called them to become because they're following the doctrines that are false that tells us we can keep living in sin and God's okay with it. Spiritual death is the result of sin. Well, not me because I'm saved. I guess that's why you got a crack pipe in your car. I guess that's why you still got needles in your car. That's why you get drunk every night. That's why you can cheat on your wife with no problem and have racism in your heart with no problem. So you don't want to hear me preach because when you let one in, about 20 more is coming with it. I done been down this road a hundred times. Guys, for 30 years, I spent my life loving those that's come out of addiction, loving those that have come from broken and dysfunctional backgrounds. Let me tell you what I've seen happen. It wasn't the drugs that they came out of that took them back. It was sex outside of marriage. It was the boyfriend they met or the girlfriend they met, and they didn't get right, and they didn't stay right. And listen, it was good for a little while, and everything was all right for, for a season. But then after a season, it started going, and then it went, because it crashes and burns. 30 years, you ask, am I telling the truth, Lisa? Hundreds, not, not a few, hundreds and hundreds of good people that were once on fire, that were once sold out, that once lived for the calling and the burning fire of God that dwelled inside of them. And a little bit of, a little bit of iniquity crept in, just a little bit. Why do you think Jesus taught us a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump? Just a little bit, it gets in there, starts growing. And it turns into two, and it turns into three. Then it talks into this. And it, it went from just being unforgiving to having foul language. And it went from foul language to, 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 to allowing this in your life. And then the next thing you know, this came into your life. And the next thing you know, you're going to church, but you as backslid as, as a prostitute on 10th Street. Mm. But we don't want to think of ourselves like that, do we? But see, I love you enough to do what the scripture says. Let me explain something to you. Say false prophets. But then the Bible says the results of that is iniquity abounds. Everybody say iniquity abounds. The third thing that happens that comes after that is the love of many wax cold. Say it with me, the love of many wax cold. So here's what happens. When you let sin run rapid, love waxes cold. You know what love is? God is love. So the nature of God is love. But it's not man's love. Because see, man's love is, well, I love you, everything's okay, God is love. There ain't no consequences, God is love. But see, that ain't, that ain't the love of God. Here's the love of God. The love of God, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loved those that mocked him. He hung on the cross and looked at the very ones who put the nails right in his hand and said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. That is the love for sinners. Here's the love for the church. I chasten those in whom I love. In other words, I'm going to correct you. In other words, that chastisement is not pleasing according to the Bible. So if I really love you, I'm going to tell you the truth. And it's going to be painful, and it's not going to be easy, and it's not going to be fun. But see, that's right the opposite of what most of these false teachers, God is love, no heaven, God's not going to judge, God's not in the coronavirus, God's not in all this, right? That God, this is not the judgment on America. Shut up. <laughs> you don't even have a clue who God is. You say, that, that, this, is their, this is their cry, that's the Old Testament. Well, ask Sapphire and Ananias if God is a judge. Ask, ask Sapphire and Ananias if God will kill a man. All because they lied to the Holy Spirit. You see, people don't read their Bible. They just read what parts they want to hear that makes them feel good. And they don't want to read the totality of the Word of God that transforms their life. Because, see, here's what I love about God. God gives me a whooping every now and then. He to wear my hiney out. And you know what? It don't feel good. When my daddy used to whoop, when Bob Johnson got a hickory after me, it hurt. And I promise you, when, when, when God... When daddy, daddy God gets his hickory out, it'll put the fear of God in you. Let me explain to you something. The Bible said the fear of God is the beginning of all knowledge. 
And let me tell you something. The church has lost its knowledge of God because they don't reverence him anymore. They don't fear him. And they've let sin come in. And when they let sin come in, the nature of God goes out the door. The Pentecost leaves. Y'all ain't hearing me preach. Because they're clinging to Passover, but they forgot Pentecost. But the whole purpose of Passover was for Pentecost. Pentecost gave us the ability to bear the image of God, which was God's plan for man in the beginning. That you bear his image. Listen, the sermons we preach are powerful. But what's more important than the sermon you preach is the sermon you live. Boy, that was a good place right there to really say amen. You ought to clap right there. See, everybody's got a great powerful word, but it's not just the word we preach and the sermons that we articulate. It has to be the life that we live. It has to be what we do, not what we tell other people that they should do, but the life that we try to live every single day by the power of the Holy Spirit that sets the example that we are the difference. We're in the world, but we are not of the world. Oh, I'm not becoming popular today. I realize that, but that's okay. So what is the answer for the sin problem? See, in America right now, we don't have a race problem. We don't have a political problem. We don't have an abuse of authority problem. We don't have a looting problem. We have a sin problem. And these are sins. We don't have a drug problem in America. We have a sin problem. We're trying to address drugs and we're addressing it with things that changes the outward behavior of mankind. And the only thing that is going to change the power of sin is the blood of Jesus and the power of Pentecost. So if we want to deal with the hatred in America... Deal with the sin because that's why hatred exists. The love of many is waxed cold. Because every time that I let sin in and sin abounds, my love becomes cold because my nature becomes less and less like God. Are you following me? And that's what's happening in America. The church quit preaching against sin. The church quit preaching about hell. The church quit preaching about anything that offends anybody. The church started preaching a powerless gospel. We believe in Jesus, but we don't talk about the Holy Ghost. We don't want to. We don't want any of that Holy Ghost stuff. Let's just, you know, because people go to the extreme with it. So we're not going to talk about the Holy Ghost. So we have taken the power out of the church. We've got them praying sinners' prayers. We've got them accepting the sacrifice of the blood. But we don't have them accepting the gift that transforms them, which is the Holy Spirit. Are y'all following me? Let, me? let me let me explain something to you. The evidence of the Holy Ghost is not the tongues you talk in. Now, I know I'm about to offend some of my Pentecostal friends, but it is not the tongues you speak in, but it's the transformation of the life you live. Because if, if it don't change you, I don't care if you speak in tongues all day long. Let me show you something scripturally. My Bible tells me in the book of 1 Corinthians that if I have the gift of, uh, uh, of tongues where I speak to angels, but I have not love, then it's nothing but a clanging symbol. It says I can have all revelations, but if I don't have love, it means nothing. Let me explain something to you. Your gifts are powerless if they're not motivated by love. And we can have all of the Christian ornaments, but if we don't have love, none of the rest of it matters. Because the love is the nature and the motivation of everything that God does. For God so loved. Let me explain something to you. When the coronavirus hit, and there was much uncertainty about what happened, I love you, and that's the very reason that I wouldn't put you in jeopardy of being here. If I thought that us being here today would jeopardize your lives, I would never have you here. There's no way. You know why? Because I love you. But now let me tell you what I do love you enough. I would love you enough to tell you that if your obedience to God costs you your life, you better obey God. 
I love you enough that if you're my friend, and I love you, and you should be my friend because Jesus was our friend, that if I love you with the love of God and I see you going down a road that's leading to your destruction and will ultimately end in your spiritual demise, if I love you, I'm going to tell you. If I don't tell you, I never loved you. Well, you, if you loved me, you wouldn't talk to me that way. My daddy loved me. That's why he, that's why he cut a, a, a hickory tree off that big silver maple tree out in front of our yard. And every time he hit me, I realized it wasn't abuse. It was because he loved me. Let me explain something to you. I was raised in an abusive home. Most people don't know what that really means. They think if you got hit on the butt with a paddle that you was raised in an abusive home, if somebody lifted their voice to you was raised in an abusive home, let me tell you something. My, my father beat the blood out of me regularly. Was it right? No. But let me tell you what it did teach me. I'm not in prison today. I'm not in prison because of every time he whipped me. I'm not in prison today because there was a boundary on how far I would go. Not because I was fearful of the law, but I, I feared what my dad would do to me. And I'm thankful today that my dad got saved and became my best friend before he died. And he was redeemed from the things and the mistakes he may have made. And I want to explain something to you today. I want to explain to you, I, I'm not bitter at him because he whipped me. And I'm not bitter at God because he has corrected me. The hardships that I have gone through and the mistakes and the consequences that I have had to pay is what has helped make me who I am today. And if it was not for the correction of the Lord, there were some things that would have never changed. Let me explain to you the love of God today. The love of God will always correct you. But the love of God will always pick you up when your heart has turned toward him. No matter how far you strayed, no matter whether it was the, the murder of Bathsheba's husband. Uh-oh. Whether it was, God, I don't trust you, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send out a census and count the people. When our hearts turn in repentance, the mercy of God picks us up. And the process continues. You understand that? Now, here's what happened. On the day of Pentecost, are y'all ready for this? It's like a basketball game. The answer to our nation today has been given to you and I. The answer is what Christ did on the cross. It's what Jesus did, and we're all waiting on Jesus to come do it. But the problem is, Jesus did it and ascended. He said, I gave you the power. I gave you the keys to the kingdom. See, what we don't understand, that when God gave us the message, and he gave us the testimony, and he gave us the power and the authority, he gave us the keys, we can either lock up heaven and not let anybody in, or we can open and let them in. What do you mean by that, Pastor? It means that God called you to be a light set on a hill. What happens when the light comes on? What happens to darkness? It flees. It dispels. So when we turn the light of God on inside of us, the darkness leaves. He called you to be the salt of the earth. So what did he do? Go preach the gospel of the kingdom. So sin abounded. The love of many waxed cold. But then the word says, he who endures to the end shall be saved. Somebody say, I need to endure. That, don't, that means that I don't let what the world's doing cause my love to grow cold or me to jump in sin because the rest of the world's in sin. If you want to jump in a pit of, uh, of hot molten tar, go ahead, but I'm not going with you. If you want to stand in the freeway and play, and, and play jacks, go ahead, but I'm not going with you. If you want to play with rattlesnakes, go ahead and play with them, but I'm not playing with them. Do you understand? Just because you do something stupid don't mean I got to go with you. The world's acting pretty stupid right now, and I refuse to be like them. But I'm not going to let their bad decisions affect the way I behave. I'm not going to get angry at them. I'm going to love them like Jesus loved them. Are y'all following me? Because here's what the Bible said. The gospel of this kingdom. 
You know what the gospel of the kingdom means? It's not just the gospel. It's the gospel of the kingdom. The kingdom is the fact that he sets and resides on the throne of our lives. <laughs> Where's the kingdom of God? Within you. So here's what God did. God said, here's the answer. I've got it right here. Now it's in your hands. I put the fullness of the keys and the authority of the kingdom in your hands. I gave you the power to open up heaven. I gave you the power and the message and the demonstration and the godliness to go bring me to the lost and the dying. I gave you the power. You, not the evangelist, not the apostle, not the prophet, not the pastor. You, I gave it to every Christian. The signs of Mark chapter 16 does not say they would follow the apostles. It says it follows all who believe. He put it in our hands. My question is, what are you going to do with what God put in your hands? He put the kingdom in your hands. Let me, let me, let me show you what he did. It's all right. I got it. Let me show you what he did. Here's what we do. We got it. We go, oh, I ain't qualified to do that. It's like, it's like we, we, we turn, we, we turn what should have been a, a, a victory into a defeat because we passed the ball to somebody else. Oh, you the preacher, you do it. That's what we pay you for. I ain't gifted to do that. You do it. We just pass it to somebody else. When the truth is, is every one of us in here are part of the body. And every one of us in here have a gift and a responsibility to share our faith. Every one of us have a responsibility and a key to tell people what Christ can and has done. You know how we overcome the devil? Let me tell you something. Satan puts his knee in the neck of a man that's crying out and begging for his life. Satan does that. Satan in humanity kills an innocent man. Y'all looking at me crazy. Just like Satan goes in and steals from a, from a target store because of another injustice. That's the devil. That's sin. Don't look at me like that. Preach your stop your halo from spinning on your horn. It's the devil. It's sin abounding. It's the temptation of Satan in, in the garden with Eve, tempting her. Go ahead, it's all right. You got justification to do this. You, it's all right. Go ahead when you do it. You're going to be a better person. You're going to make the world a better place when you, when you do what God said don't do. And you justify it. Are you with me? And you know what happens when we justify sin, right? And we make room for it in our lives. That's what's happening in our nation right now. And we have the power to annihilate that by the bringing forth of the gospel of the kingdom. The Bible said we overcome the devil by the blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony, and we love not our lives unto death. Say this with me, the word of my testimony. Here's what stops most Christians from sharing their faith. I don't know how. I don't know the Bible well enough. I got a question, what did God do for you? How many of you in this room have been dramatically transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, please stand up. Somebody say, I got a testimony. If you have been healed by the power of God, raise your hand. If God taught you how to love the unlovable, raise your hand and wave it like that. Yeah, go ahead. Those of you in this room right now that God taught you how to be a daddy and taught you how to be a mama, raise your hands. Come on, if God taught you how to be a husband and taught you how to be a wife because before you was hateful, mean, and rude and maybe a wife beater and a, a husband basher, but when you got saved, you learned how to love your spouse. It changed you. Some of you in this room were racist. Some of you hated people because of the color of their skin. But when God came on the scene, you started loving people. Am I right? Because the power of God changes your lives. So somebody say, I got a testimony. So God put the ball in your hands. God put the ball in your hands. God put the ball in your hands. Are you going to pass it to somebody else or are you going to take the shot? All you got to do is take the shot and we win. 
All you got to do is put it in, put it in the, put it in the hoop, honey. We win. Do you hear me? If the church would start being the church, we'll win. Because the gospel of this kingdom is going to be preached in all of the world. Bow your heads with me. All over this building, before I pray for the church, I've got a question. If you're in this room today and you say, Pastor Lance, if I died right now, I'm not ready to meet Jesus. I don't know if I've been born again. Maybe you've been born again, you backslid. I don't know. But your, your heart, you're not really where God wants you to be today. My invitation today is not embarrassment. It's not to humiliate. I would never humiliate anybody. I would never, I would never in my lifetime judge another individual. I would never preach to hurt anybody. It's not in my nature. I may get upset. I may make mistakes. I may do some things wrong. But I would never intentionally go out to hurt somebody or embarrass them. I don't want to do that to nobody. I want people's lives to be changed. If you're here today and you would say, Pastor, I'm not where I need to be with God, David. I want to get my life right with God. While people's heads are bowed and eyes are closed and people are praying, I want you right where you are. If you need him to raise your hand, just raise it. Say, Pastor, I need him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm asking you right now where you are to do something that Jesus asked you to do. Repent. What does that mean, Pastor? Repent don't mean to feel sorry for what you've done. Repent means to turn away from it and walk away. Just make up your mind right now. I'm done living the way I've been living. I'm not going back. When I walk out these doors today, I'm not going back to the life I was living. I refuse to be what I was. And believe that Christ died for your sins. Not only to forgive you, but that he died so that your sins could be forgiven, that you could receive the glorious gift of the Holy Spirit. That you truly could be born again and become changed. And open your heart today and receive that. Open your heart today and say, I believe Christ died for my sins. I confess with my mouth that Jesus died for my sins. And I believe and I confess that Christ rose from the grave. And I receive the glorious gift of the Holy Spirit right now. God, I'm asking you right now as people all over this building are praying that God, that the power of regeneration, the power of the Holy Spirit fall on every person in this room. Because not only does the Holy Spirit transform, it empowers. It empowers us to operate in the supernatural. And I pray right now, God, for a baptism of fire. God, I don't need the emotions, but God, I mean a baptism of fire that will mark us and transform us and use us for your glory. God, today, brand us by fire. Brand our lives and mark us with your glorious image that our lives will never be the same. That we walk out of these buildings today empowered and changed to serve you and to live for you. To be bold and courageous to preach the word to our families, our friends, our loved ones. That we will not make foolish statements, that's what we pray the preacher for. But that we would all be vessels to be used. We may not all be gifted speakers, but we can all, we can all testify. We can all share what we know that God has done for us. And we can always share what we do know and understand. And God, I'm asking you to use every man and woman in this room. Our nation needs revival. Our nation needs awakening. And God, I pray today that Relevate Church will become part of that revival and awakening right now today. That God, we will be, Father, a, a, a unit of men and women that are full of the fire of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name. Those of you today that are coming to get baptized, if you need to go, Miss Janet, there are some that need clothes. So if you, uh, Miss Janet, just go into the back of the sanctuary, please stay with me just a minute.
If you need to be baptized today and you came for that, if you will follow Miss Janet, if you need to change clothes, you can go back and do that right now. Get ready for baptism. We're going to baptize in just a moment. I want to share this. Six, I don't know, it's been two, three years ago. Three years ago, we started remodeling this house up here. How long ago was it, John? Three years? You helped me. And we began the process of, of renovating that house there. The gentleman that was doing the renovation stole $36,000 from the church. Stole it. Didn't, 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 I mean, scammed us out of it. Police called him guilty as charged the whole nine yards. Scammed us out of it. Lied to us. Bought the materials stuff and we paid him for the materials. He would instantly take the receipts back and get his money back and took the money. The, he went to the, he went to the, uh, he went to the sheriff's department and, and tried to take a warrant for me and said I pulled a gun on him. Guys, most of you in this room know me. If I'd have pulled a gun on that man, he wouldn't be here today. It's the truth. You look at me and say, if he would have, I, he wouldn't be here today. But I didn't pull a gun on him. 